Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are with Cecilia Malmstrom, uh, and it's a great honor to have you here with us today at the Center for Innovation in Global Politics and Economics at IE University. Cecilia is a very well-known figure. She has been a member of the European Parliament, a minister for EU affairs in Sweden, and commissioner twice, but we also know her very much uh, with her fights for, for free trade in the world. So we are going to have a conversation about uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics uh, today. So Cecilia, I just want to ask you so many big questions, uh, looking for short answers. So this is going to be a tough one, but uh, I hope we will have other occasions to get in depth with all these questions in the, in the future. Thank you, Kate. It's great to be here. Thank you. And um, I, I just want to start with, um, with the conversation about interdependencies. Now, it's a, it's a word now that we use very often. Previously, interdependencies was a good thing. And now it's rather a bad thing that we, need, we are trying to get over. We are trying to de-risk, French or Now we have discussed all these issues very much. This was already a living conversation, not only about China and Russia, but also our biggest and most important ally, the United States. But after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this has become, together with geoeconomics, a buzzword. You know, like now we are, we are trying to uh, de-risk from everything. And the EU clearly needs better policies to counter unfair competition and in, uh, economic coercion and instrumentalization of strategic dependencies. And this is happening at a time where technological advances and developments in green technologies and industries are, are, are taking a phase. So we are not just facing all these idea of de-risking and, and, and geoeconomics at site, but we are also going through a period of clear and important change. As I said, I'm going to ask you big questions. So if looking at this picture, what are the biggest fault lines for Europe for the years to come? Well, these are indeed big questions. <laughs> uh, I would say that interdependence is still a good term. It is good to be interdependent because that forms alliances, uh, possibilities of cooperation, you learn from each other, you, you exchange uh, views culturally, it promotes innovation. And the big problems the world is facing today are global. And we need, we are interdependent in that. We cannot solve the, the global climate crisis, so we cannot fight poverty or, or the health issues, uh, etc. without cooperation. So interdependence is a good thing. And I think we, we need to, to, to say that because it has kind of been forgotten. Now, of course, there, there are items where, where the the pandemic and, and also the, 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 the war in Ukraine has shown that we are very vulnerable to, to certain uh, things in, in the trade era or in the geoeconomic area, if you want to. And this, of course, needs to be addressed, as you say, with, with new tools. But we need to keep those tools there and remember that for most of trade, most of our interconnections, it still works and we should, we should preserve them. We should not build up protectionist barriers for all our trade because that is a good thing. It, it, it creates prosperity and, and interchanges and, and, and growth and jobs and investment. But for those vulnerable things, and we saw that during the pandemic where there was a loss of, of medical equipment, for instance, that maybe we need to have that closer to home for the next pandemic or whatever will happen. We saw, we saw it in several EU member states during, well, in Russia's terrible invasion of, of Ukraine, how they instrumentalized the use of oil and gas forcing Europe to do the transition quicker, a good thing. And we see it today when Europe uh, and the world is very dependent on some, some metals and minerals, rare earth metals as we call them, that are crucial for the whole green transition. Mm. We talk about nickel and copper and magnesium, um, lithium. We have them in, in your iPhones, in, in, in the computers, in quantum computing, but we need them also for the green transition in windmills, in, in electric vehicles, etc. And there the world is very dependent on China because they control, own, process, extract more than 80% of all that. So of course there is a need for diversity and we need to do that in, in a clever way and uh, addressing that phenomena but also via cooperation because the world needs to cooperate to see where can we find these minerals, where can we do it in a sustainable way where we not violate human rights. We know that that is a problem for instance in, in the region of Congo. Uh, where there's child labor and so on, how can we do it in a way that, that is, is sustainable for, for the future as well, while 
you know, also keeping most of, of the other trade up and going. Maybe I can ask you a question on China because I, this is a buzzword. No, both you and I spent uh, some time in Washington DC this summer and the, the conversation we have heard that now that Jake Sullivan said de-risking in his Brookings speech, we mean the same thing. The Europeans and the Americans are on the same page on the issue of de-risking and we will have common action. But for me, this is not necessarily the case because de-risking for the Americans is very much about, also very much about keeping the American hegemony on track mm -hmm. on world politics and economics, while in the case of Europeans, multilateralism is still in the DNA and there is also concrete benefits coming from trade relations and other relations with China related to innovation, growth and fight for public goods that you have been mentioning. So looking from a European perspective, what should be the next steps forward without offending so much our American friends when it comes to China policy? Well, it's not very much about offending. I think we have a very frank and open uh, discussion. We try not to fight in public because it, at this point uh, it only makes Mr. Putin happy when we are taking that. So, so, you know, we discuss and we have a frank dialogue. And I agree with you with that. I don't think de-risking means exactly the same thing. No. In the US, I mean, Republicans and Democrats don't agree on much, but they agree to be as tough as possible towards China. They can call it decoupling or de-risking, but it's basically the same thing. For us, I think it means focusing on where the risks are. I talked about these critical minerals, but also we see that there has been some aggressive Chinese um, investments in Europe uh, relating to critical infrastructure. Now we have tools to address with investment screening, to, to see that, yes, we welcome investment, but there are some critical infrastructure that maybe not. Uh, we have instruments on anti-coercion because we saw that China has used that against Lithuania when they established more formal relations with Taiwan. And they, they you know, so we need to have tools for that. But we also, as you say, we, we need to work with China. We need, and we do every day, trade a lot with China. Um, we need to have them in the fight against climate change and in the green transition. We need China to work, for, to work with them on, on reforming the WTO. Uh, but then there is, of course, a competition element in Europe as well. We shouldn't be naive. It's not only an American problem. Yeah. I mean, the majority of electric vehicles today in Europe are Chinese. And this is, of course, putting a lot of pressure on, on, our, on our industries as well. We see that in Germany, where the, the classical car industry, which is so important part of, of Germany, they're having difficulties. Uh, but, but building up protectionist walls is also not the way out of it, because being open for investment and cooperation has been the success of the European Union. That is why we have this internal market that also others have access to. So we must be very careful in finding that balance. Actually, this is a very good point, because the European Union keeps on publishing new strategies. No, we have the economic security strategy, we have the new industrial strategy, we see constant work on, on regulations on artificial intelligence and other regulations that could that could think about all these problems that we are we are talking about. But the core of the issue is still there. Mm. The internal market benefits from free trade. The EU has this understanding of world economy running around the rules and regulations and institutions mm. watching them. Mm. So on the one side, there's this idea of let's not let the others shape the years. On, and on the other side, we are very much in trouble keeping up with the, the, the industries of the, of the world and, 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 and the competition. So how do you see these strategies? If you were still at the helm, for example, in the European Commission, what would be your advices or what would be your strategies to go, go forward in this, how to square this circle? It's a tough one. I, I think the European Commission is, is showing a lot of leadership in, in these difficult times, but there is, uh, you know, there is an inflation in strategies. Uh, and they're more or less saying the same things. Yeah. And it's a lot of what, but very little how. how? Um, so we, we need to do all these things. Yes, we need to be aware of, of the, 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 the sensitivities and, and that are security related that I talked about uh, earlier. Um, but we also need to, to cooperate. We need to make sure that, I mean, we have this internal market. It's not perfect. We have a lot of work to do. And we've been talking for ages about finalizing the internal market. Well, start doing it. We know that member states are not doing what they promised to do 
15 years ago. There are so much administrative procedures on licensing and in standards and permissions and, and, and uh, you know, recognitions that, that doesn't work. And it, it's bureaucratic, it's boring, but it's worth millions. So we should start digging at home and make the, the, uh, the, um, the internal market a real internal market because there are lots to, to do that. And yes, we have a competition problem, but we cannot punish other countries because they've been more inno innovative than we have. We can find out that you know, competition has to be fair and that's why we must keep on fighting for multilateralism and common rules. And we have taken some, some rules uh, ourselves, but we cannot punish another country for having you know, more digital companies than we have. That, then we must do better. We must invest more in digitalization. We must show that we can find a creative way of using artificial intelligence with all the, the, the you know, questions that that brings uh, as well. And, and we've known for a long time we need to do that. It's not, you know, it, it's not rocket science, <laughs> but it's, it's easy to say, but hard to do. Yeah, I think this component of unorthodox competition is going to be shaping European policies very much. And we were recently in a panel together in Sweden when it was a Swedish presidency, mm -hmm. talking about the relationship between the questions of competitiveness and the EU's relationship with third countries. You know, it's like third countries in various senses, starting with wider Europe, mm -hmm. cooperation with other countries in the continent, including enlargement, but not only also foreign and security policy cooperation with other countries in the continent and other regions and other countries uh, in the world, starting with Africa, Latin America, and of course, moving into uh, countries of Asia, starting with China, India and, and, and others. So what is, in your opinion, the clear link between the EU's way out from this unorthodox competition and its relationship to its its relationships, basically, it's it's linked to its relationships with third countries in the world, starting with wider Europe. Yeah, but it, it's all linked together. We need to do our homework to improve our what we have, and, and the internal market is something unique. Uh, we should do much more of this. We should nourish and develop our trade relations. We have trade agreements with a lot of countries in the world and others are in negotiation. They are good because they bring not only benefits for, for both partners, but they also encourage different kinds of, of, of cooperation that we were not aware of uh, before. And they bring innovation, new ideas and cultural knowledge uh, and so on. And then we must keep on fighting for, for a multilateral framework. Uh, I know people think it's naive to say that today, but you know, without the, that, we're lost. And Europe is built in a system where there are rules and where there is multilateralism. And if that fails, we will suffer a lot. And developing countries will suffer even more, and we don't want that. So we must engage via international organizations, and they are weak today. We, and we must recognize that big international organizations such as IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations Security Council, they are not reflecting the world of today. I mean, the, what we sometimes call the global south. I know that is a bit controversial for someone, yeah. but, but they must have more influence in these organizations. They are proportionately less influenced than others. And the global north, if you want, m must give up a little bit to show that we are willing to engage, to discuss reforms, but, but to, to, to do this as a signal. Uh, otherwise, I don't think they will come to the, to, to the negotiating table. Just a final, final, final question, since we, I know we are both very much interested in this. What is the role of enlargement in all this? Oh, enlargement is key. Enlargement is something we've been talking about for a long time. It happened, I was there, I was in the European Parliament for the big enlargement in 2004. It was a fantastic moment. That was a moment when Europe, you know, there were optimism and the wall had fallen and the, the, the Soviet Union had fallen. And we thought that we could, you know, multilateralism was, was booming and, and the transatlantic relationship was very strong. That's not the world of today, but you know, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has I mean, severely changed the, the security order of the world, this is geopolitically the only way forward. We, we must stand by our promises to invite Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, but also the countries on the Balkans, and one day, hopefully Turkey, to join the European Union. 
Uh, we must make it possible. We should not lower our demands. We must push for, 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 for the criteria to be respected. But we must make it credible because we've been talking about this for, for ages and nothing has happened. And they lost faith and they've turned elsewhere. And that is partly our fault. And we must also do our homework. We cannot have a European Union with 40 member countries, with you know 40 commissioners and the same voting rules and a European Parliament of thousand seats. I mean, it doesn't work. And we can, the budget rules. So we must reform ourselves as well. We should push them to, to go for the criteria, but we must also take the lead in doing this because this is a way to solve many of those, not to solve, but to approach many of those problems we've been discussing here today, uh, you know, by doing it with our neighbours. Thank you very much. There are so many other questions that I would love to ask. And as I said, I'm hoping to have you way more in the Centre for Innovation in Global Politics and Economics. Thank you very much, Cecilia Malmstrom, for being with us today and looking forward to having you again in Madrid. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Ilke, and good luck with this new centre. Thank you very much.